Getting from point A to point B. That's taking longer in many parts of Idaho, especially the Treasure Valley. Our roads are getting more crowded as the population skyrockets. The Idaho Transportation Department's never-ending task to keep up and try to get ahead on the budget it has to work with. Major projects are underway right now, others being planned. Today, ITD Director Brian Ness on what the department is doing to keep the cars and trucks moving and the funding needed to get the job done. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Does your drive to work or school or a relative's house or the store take longer? With as much population growth as our area has absorbed over the last few years, it's understandable and expected. You're no doubt driving through construction zones too, as road departments work to widen, improve, and maintain our highways, streets, and bridges to keep up with the growth and the wear and tear. Now, many of those projects are done by local jurisdictions, the highway districts, cities and counties. The Idaho Transportation Department focuses on interstate highways, U.S. highways and state highways. Today, we're looking at the work ITD is doing, the challenges it faces and how it's planning for the future. According to ITD's website, the department is responsible for 5,000 miles of highways and 1,700 bridges in Idaho. It has 1,632 employees and a roughly $750 million budget for fiscal year 2020. My guest today has overseen it all since 2009 when he became director of the Idaho Transportation Department. He is Brian Ness. Director Ness, thank you for being here today. Ah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Well, Director Ness, um, first of all, just uh, how big of a part of the conversation is growth right now at ITD? That's a significant part of our conversation. 10 or 11 years ago when I became director, the concern was how do we keep the existing system in the condition that it's in, and, and we allocated additional revenue towards that. But more and more, growth is becoming a huge issue, and we're trying to stay ahead of that growth but it's becoming harder and harder as the state just continues to grow and the population continues to boom. Can't build the roads fast enough, or is that just it's because it's exploded so fast? Can't build the roads fast enough, and there isn't enough revenue to take care of all our needs that are out there right now. So um, you also have a, 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 a thing called STIP, which I understand is Statewide Transportation mm -hmm. Improvement Program. What is that, first of all, and then like, what, what are the priorities on it? It's our five-year plan, and our priorities from a state standpoint, certainly Interstate 84 is a priority. It's a primary east-west uh, corridor. You've seen us put a lot of work into that in mm -hmm. the last 10 to 15 years. And then certainly uh, uh, State Street, uh, uh, which would be Highway 44, and then Chinden, US 20, US 26. And some of those projects are going on um, already, of course. So uh, overall, how would you describe the current condition of Idaho's roads and bridges in terms of maintaining them? From a maintenance point of view, the highways are in pretty good shape, although again, those highways were, have been in place for maybe as long as 50 years. So from a functionality standpoint, now they've exceeded that life. Uh, you, if you notice that cars are backing up on, on ramps and, and exit ramps onto the freeway, uh, certainly we can accommodate now on some of our uh, uh, highways with more bicycle and pedestrian traffic mm -hmm. and those types of things. So as we go through, we're trying to what I would call modernize uh, our highway system and expand uh, those for growth. Bridges is a, another story is that uh, we have about 1,800 bridges, maybe a little more than that, and over half of those will have exceeded their design life of 50 to 60 years within the next year or two. You mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you know, not enough revenue to keep up on this. You know, years ago, we heard a lot about the yearly shortfall of money um, just for maintenance. Mm -hmm. It was about the, the figure we heard was about two hundred forty million dollars back at that time. Mm -hmm. Where does that situation stand right now in terms of the funding for maintenance? So, in two thousand fifteen, the legislature passed a transportation revenue package, raised the gas tax and the registration fees. That got us maybe about a third to halfway there of uh, meeting that number that we need to preserve the system. Again, that focus was to keep the system in the condition that it is in right now and not let it deteriorate any further. But we still have that huge gap in safety and capacity type projects. Now, I know you don't like to get political, um, but what does your agency need from the legislature to, to be able to catch up, get the job done? 
Well, right now, uh, the numbers that we just talked about were from the 2011 Governor's Funding Task Force Report on Transportation. In fact, Governor Little, when he was uh, Lieutenant Governor, was chair of uh, mm. that group that put that report together. Right now, a, a group of a uh, couple of associations have contracted with Boise State University to take a look at those numbers and say, what are the new numbers? What is the need? How is growth impacting what those numbers are? And when they complete that study, then uh, they'll submit that to the governor. The governor will sit down with our department, we'll take a look at that, and then work with the legislature to say, what's our plan moving forward? But until we have those numbers in mm -hmm. hand, it's hard to say what exactly is the need right now. So you anticipate hearing more about that, or we'll be hearing more about that over the next year or two? Uh, probably somewhere uh, by summer, we should uh, see some uh, revised numbers on what the need is, uh, both to preserve the system and what's needed to address safety and capacity. Um, okay, let's talk about one of the major projects, of course, the, here right through the heart of the valley that is going on, the huge project there mm -hmm. between Nampa and Caldwell. Uh, work's been going on. We know that it, I think one of the op overpasses opened up two months mm -hmm. ahead of schedule yes. even. How important is getting that project finished uh, how, how important is it to get that project finished and what will it mean to the valley? And, and you've seen what we've done over the last 10 to 15 years as we've expanded uh, Interstate 84 mm -hmm. from Micron all the way through the Boise area, right. gone from two to four lanes. Imagine what that would be like if we hadn't done that work where we'd be right now. So now we're looking to continue west. Uh, we'll go from Napa to Caldwell and we'll be adding uh, a third lane uh, in each direction. And we're scheduled to complete that somewhere around 2023, all work should be complete. And that's where the growth is happening too. It's, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the growth is from yes. West Meridian mm -hmm. and out that direction. And so that has to be a focus, right? Absolutely, Western Ada County, Eastern Canyon County, that's where the growth is concentrated right now. And you will see our projects continue to move west uh, mm -hmm. into those areas where the growth is. You mentioned Highway 2026, Chinden Boulevard also. Um, work has basically started to expand it from Eagle Road out to the interstate eventually. Mm -hmm. That's going to take several years as well. But that's, that's kind of a hand-in-hand a -hand parallel uh, project, right? Because we need to get traffic flowing better through that part of uh, Ada and Canyon counties. Yes, you'll see us expand again Chinden from two to four lanes uh, just about past uh, where Highway 16 ties in now, mm -hmm. just past uh, Star Road. And you'll see us do the same thing on Highway 44, uh, known as State Street. So both those were expanding yeah. those lanes and, and all the projects are scheduled again around that 2023 mark seems to be uh, kind of that magic number where uh, all the projects will be complete as we uh, move west. There's also that idea of connecting to the interstate north and south routes. Yes. The big project we hear about a lot is Highway 16 and extending it from state all the way to the interstate. I think it's about 7.5 miles of a project mm -hmm. that's remaining. Um, what's the status of that? So right now uh, we have $8 million ad allocated for the engineering study, which will look at what the design of the road will look like, uh, uh, what the alignment will be. Um, those types of things. And then we have another 90 million that the board's allocated to start buying right away and to start preserving that corridor so we can do paving in the future. We're, we have a, kind of a rendering that uh, ITD produced that's on the screen right now, the kind of what it will look like. But it seems like north-south is really becoming more crucial, right? Because of the building that's going on in Star, Middleton, mm -hmm. um, Eagle, yeah. and even you know, into the Emmett area. It's interesting when we looked at uh, our north-south movement in the valley, and you look at where Interstate 84 is, and then you look at where State Street is, and the river's in between. So where you have major interchanges on the interstate, and you go north, they all stop at the river with the exception of Eagle Road. And then you look at where the major intersections are at State Street, and they come down, they stop at the river. And again, the only connectivity from the major roads going south from State Street and heading north from Interstate 84, is Eagle Road and now Highway 16, which is crucial to get that additional river crossing. Yeah. So there has to be a way now, how do you get, um, so as you go north, then you have to go east or west then to get across the river. Right, and I, I guess one of the questions is, is there ever, is it would even be possible, or is there ever a talk or a dream of having Highway 55 as it goes from Eagle north, you know, to McCall, um, 
have that go straight through to the interstate? Is that even possible? Is there any talk of that or adding in some other north-south routes or is the focus Highway 16 right now? Well, right now the focus is Highway 16. And I would say there was discussion at one point uh, right before I got here as director mm -hmm. about extending 55 across the river instead of jogging over. Mm -hmm. But uh, those... So um, there was discussion. There was that, discussion. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you go to the ACHD uh, website, there, there's some information on that about that project. But it came down to is that uh, the money would never have been available to do that. Mm -hmm. So that project was abandoned at, at that time. You mentioned that some of the funding is available for the Highway 16 project, uh, the 90 million for right of way purchases mm -hmm. and things like that. I think the overall estimate is $450 million to extend it those eight miles. Why is it so expensive to, to build new road mm -hmm. now? Well, you think about what property values do in a growing area. So that's the first piece of that. And then just construction costs. Uh, we were relatively lucky the past oh, 10 to 15 years as construction costs didn't escalate dramatically. But now with the economy the way it is, the competition for materials and particularly for people and workers, uh, we're starting to see a spike in our construction costs. So all those things contribute to that. And it's just, it's expensive to uh, build roadways and, and particularly bridges. I was going to say, you mentioned the river. Uh, that probably adds a lot to it with environmental uh, restrictions and requirements Absol that you have to Absolutely, take yes. care of. Well, um, you can get a lot more information on uh, projects that are underway right now or are planned just by going to itdprojects.org um, online. There's, you know, there are video presentations on there and other information as well. It's itdprojects.org. Now, when we come back, Director Ness and I will continue our conversation next on Viewpoint, the importance of collaboration in keeping our roads and bridges up to par. To be a great explorer, you need intelligent four-wheel drive, an active terrain management system, the most available driver assist technology of any vehicle in its class, and enough cargo space for any adventure. The all-new 2020 Ford Explorer, it's the greatest exploration vehicle of all time. Now, lease a new all-wheel drive Explorer for just $2.99 a month, only at your local Ford stores. Need a good reason to shop the fantastic four-day sale at Denver Mattress? How about four? Right now, the more you buy, the more you save. Save 100 bucks on every thousand you spend. And for you sporty types, check out the queen-sized Athlete's Choice Silver, now only $664.99. Save big on the budget-friendly Summit. Buena Vista Firm. Or Arapahoe. And the most fantastic of all, seven years, no interest financing. But don't wait, the fantastic four-day sale at Denver Mattress ends Monday. Our journey begins in the majestic falls of liquid. Scratch that, man. Just sip and chill with any size iced coffee for $1.50 or get refreshed with any of these drinks. A church divided. One side steadfast in tradition, the other searching for a change. Yeah, I think it's heartbreaking when the body of Christ divides over any issue. With the largest congregation in the West here in Boise, for us, it's how we are treated and how our family is treated. Maybe God can use a divide for good. Tuesday, tracing the growing fracture in the global faith community, starting right here at home. Tuesday at 10 on Idaho's News Channel 7. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story and I don't know where to start. I still have nightmares. I feel overwhelmed. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Welcome back to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Today we're focusing on the Idaho Transportation Department's roadmap for dealing with growth. My guest today is Idaho Transportation Department Director Brian Ness. Well, Director Ness, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing the department today? Well, interestingly enough, we spent the first segment talking about funding, and while that's a challenge, our biggest challenge now is attracting and keeping good people. The economy's better than it's ever been. People are looking around at uh, maybe other opportunities that are out there. And we had, a, 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 we continually lose people to retirement that you had that big bubble that came mm -hmm. through when the uh, interstate program was built and they all retired in the 
80s, and now that next bubble is continuing to hit us pretty hard, and then to find new workers to come in gets harder and harder to do that. So we're concerned about being able to attract that workforce to uh, continue to do the things that we do. Well, your workforce is also going to be busy starting in, later on in the spring um, gathering information. Um, we'll touch on specifically how to do that in, in just a minute, but how important is collaboration um, about you know, what the partners ITD has across the state? And, and at the top of the show, you talked about our responsibility for interstate highways, U.S. routes, and, and Idaho routes, mm -hmm. and then the locals maintain their system, but they're all interconnected. And when you drive to work, you're using a local road, you're probably using a, a state highway and then maybe uh, going on a local road and from your standpoint as the user you really don't care who maintains or operates that system you just want to be able to get from point A to point B so we have to work very closely with our local partners to make sure we're coordinating things and particularly with all the construction going on you don't want to start having construction on alternate routes people might take as a result of construction on one project. So we have to coordinate all those things. Okay, like for instance, you know, the Chinden Boulevard being a um, uh, being an ITD project because mm -hmm. it's a state highway, um, uh, but then um, ACHD may be working on one of the cross streets or something like Correct. that. Correct. So we want to, make, or we don't want ACHD doing major work on, let's say, Ustic or McMillan when we're working on Chinden because those might become alternate routes. The same way we don't need to be working on our routes if ACHD is doing some major work on one of theirs. So we do coordinate very closely to make sure that we can keep some mobility going in the east-west direction as we continue to do that construction. So with that collaboration in mind, what's the department planning to do, I believe starting in April? So our board typically in the summer travels around the state and uh, they take six months starting in April and go to different areas of the state with six board meetings. So the day before those board meetings, what we'll be doing is um, having all the local agencies in that area come together, uh, both elected officials and appointed officials, and we'll be talking about what are our projects, what do we plan to do, but then how do you take advantage of economy of scales? For example, if we're doing a road project on Main Street, Idaho, and two years later the city may be coming through doing a water and sewer project and tearing up our road that doesn't make a lot of sense to the taxpayers so can we coordinate that and take advantage of that where it saves costs for both the local agency and the state of idaho so we'll go around the state and, and uh, start looking at how we can be more efficient how we can take advantage of combining projects and squeeze more money out of the system then in the afternoon we'll all sit down as a group and say what are our needs in this area? What are the safety needs? What are the growth needs? What are the real transportation needs that are in there? And then at the end of the uh, summer, we'll have a list from across the state of one, where we save money, and two, what's still a need that's out there. And that's about dealing with growth, but also dealing with perhaps, as you mentioned, like the older roads and the older bridges to make sure that's coordinated? That and how you're coordinating with other modes of transportation, whether it be a transit system with pedestrians, mm -hmm. bicyclists, now, um, I found out today when you came in, you, you mentioned um, that the White House had asked the Idaho Transportation Department to do a case study. And um, from what I've read, it's about um, efficiency in supervision, basically. Mm -hmm. What was the case study's focus and why did the White House ask for it? So the White House heard what we have done and we won probably over 140 national awards for some of the work we've done to become more innovative and efficient as a department. But I remember 10 years ago, one of my first interviews was with you and we were talking about the nine layers of supervision. Mm -hmm. How do you reduce those? How do you eliminate the 62 positions that only supervised one employee? So we went through and, and we've restructured. Uh, we've eliminated over 10% of our workforce and you would think eliminating that many employees, your production would go down. But our performance measures are through the roof. They've never been better. And the morale of our employees is better because now they feel they have ownership in, in their job and they're able to make decisions, not being told how to do their job. The White House is very interested in how you get better production with less employees and ask us to do a case study. So we're very proud that uh, that is out there and, and that they're using that as a model for across the country as to uh, 
how you uh, operate uh, a government agency. Well, how, how did that create more efficiencies in getting the work done? Um, was it a, in shifting people to the, the front lines, I think, is maybe how you've described it? Yeah, a, a lot of it was eliminating the layers and moving more people to the front line. But in the end, I think the magic bullet was the fact that the employees were making decisions. For example, we have something now we call it Swarm the Storm, which came from the employees themselves, where they said it doesn't make sense to run three shifts in a maintenance garage when 30% of the time we're fighting winter snow. And so we will meet with the weather service twice a week, and if the storm's going to hit on the weekend, we'll take our weekend on Tuesday or Wednesday. If it's going to hit at night, why do we come in at 7 in the morning? We'll wait and come in in the afternoon and fight the storm at night. So they needed less people to fight the storm creating a lot of efficiency and saving a lot of money, but at the same time, our percentage of time the roads were clear of ice and snow 10 years ago was 28%. Today, 86% of the time during a storm, you can drive the speed limit on the road because it's clear of snow and ice. Has this winter, particularly through the valley, given the roads a bit of a break? You know, it's interesting is we've had a pretty good winter and the valley has got a break. However, the rest of the state, they're experiencing winter and probably experiencing about as severe of winter, I won't say as we've seen in a while, but uh, uh, winter's alive and well in the rest of the state, believe me. So you started here in 2009. Obviously your first focus, as you were just talking about, was the efficiency and kind of the restructuring, the management um, mm -hmm. structure of the department. What's the, the focus now for you? Our focus now is, is to continue to build uh, on what we've done. Uh, certainly, we continue to look at how we deliver our projects, and that means constructing projects, getting them out on the street in a timely manner, within the scope, within the, the budget we've allocated, and still make sure that the quality of those projects is still there. Um, and again, our focus also uh, internally is continuing to develop our next leaders. As I said, it's getting harder and harder to attract people, and we have to have people ready to step into those leadership positions. Again, a lot of people at the top will be retiring in the next mm -hmm. five years or so, and, and we're really focusing on those leadership skills that that next generation of employees needs. All right, we're gonna take another time out. Um, another big issue that a lot of people have been hearing about and a deadline is approaching is about the star card. Yes. So I just want to get your thoughts on the Idaho Real ID. Do you have Idaho's Real ID, the star card? A little more than seven months until the deadline. Next, why you should think about getting one. Buy more, save more. During the fantastic four-day sale at Furniture Row. That's four fantastic days to save 100 bucks on every thousand you spend. With the best selection at the lowest prices guaranteed, it's the perfect time to design a new living room, dining room, bedroom, or fall into a new mattress and check out doorbusters while they last. Plus seven years, no interest financing. But don't wait, the fantastic four day sale at Furniture Row ends Monday. It's time to shake things up at breakfast. Sure, you could have the same old, same old, or you could bite into the Chicken McGriddles or the McChicken Biscuit. Get both for just three bucks and add any size coffee for a dollar. Got you a custom jersey. Thanks, man. Wait, it reads colon instead of colon. Ooh. You missed the accent. I know how you feel. I was missing my favorite games, but then I switched to DirecTV and they also gave me this season of NBA League Pass. Now I can watch the NBA whenever and wherever I want. Hey, maybe next time invite your half-brother, Sammy Coleman. <laughs> TV without NBA League Pass is just kind of TV. Switch to DirecTV to get this season of NBA League Pass and save an extra $120. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. We all want our kids to grow up safe and healthy, so we show them how and we tell them with honest conversations that let them know what we expect. That's especially important when it comes to alcohol and other drugs. Kids need to know the dangers and how to avoid them. And when it comes to pain medications, opioids, they need to know that they should never be taken without a prescription and never shared with friends or family. It's dangerous and illegal. So talk with your kids, because when you talk, they hear you. What's the empty suitcase for? The grand prize trophy. I was born to be somebody. 
Well, the deadline to get a star card is October 1st of this year. It's the ID that's in compliance with federal law, but why do you need one? My guest today is ITD Director Brian Ness. Uh, Director Ness, first of all, why would you advise somebody to get a star card? If you're going to fly or you need to get into a federal building or get into a military base starting October 1st of this year, you will be required to have a star card, which is a star on your driver's license. It's, like it's in the upper right hand corner, I yes, believe. Yes, it is. Um, does somebody absolutely have to get one or are there alternative modes? Of they don't have to get one. And in Idaho, we're not mandating that you get one. Other states actually are mandating that you have a, a star card. So if you want to use a passport or a military ID to, to fly or get into those facilities, you can use that also. Yeah, and um, that would just be a little more inconvenient, I guess, the idea of having a star card is the one ID that can do all of that rather yes. than having to carry multiple forms. Well, um, I believe 268,000 of one and a quarter million licensed drivers in Idaho have a star card um, so far, and the deadline is approaching pretty quickly. Yes. So, um, you know, time is of the essence. Yes, and I would assume that uh, there's some people say, I'll just use my passport, or we're going to have a run on October on September 30th say I need to get my card by tomorrow so I'll encourage everyone if you think you're gonna get a star card by October 1st do it early because the lines may get longer so you get closer to October 1. Oh no doubt <laughs> no so. doubt about it that would certainly be the case um, so just in general do you know like why did the federal government want to have this uniform type of uh, ID across the country? This all came out of 9-11 when those who hijacked the airplanes had false IDs, and this is just a way to track to make sure that uh, it's you are the person who has that card. It's just a more stringent, uh, I'd call it a background check as you get that license. Okay. Um, well, Director Ness, thank you so much for your time, as always. Uh, I appreciate thank it. Thanks for the uh, overall update on where everything stands with our roads and funding and projects and everything. I appreciate the opportunity to come on and to talk about what we're doing. We're doing a lot of good things at ITD. Thank you very much, sir. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. Have a great day.